So on behalf of the grassroots media team at Weave News, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's live discussion, examining the events of January 6th and their connection with ongoing struggles for justice in the United States. Whether you're joining us on Zoom or on our Facebook live stream, thank you very much for being here. Please be aware that we are recording this event so that we can make it available to the public afterwards. My name is John Collins. I'm the editorial director at Weave News. Since 2007, Weave News has been investigating underreported stories, highlighting alternative perspectives and promoting grassroots media production and critical media literacy. And the core of our identity as an organization is grassroots media for social justice. Before I introduce tonight's guests, just a few words about the topic. When an organized mob of white supremacists violently descended on the US Capitol on January 6th in an effort to keep Donald Trump in power, corporate and establishment media coverage featured a litany of questions that reflected establishment worldviews. Questions like, how could this happen? Who are these people? Why weren't there more police? How can we beef up security in order to prevent further violence? Much less prominent though, and sometimes entirely absent in this coverage was a detailed discussion of deeper issues. Things like fascism, things like white supremacy and settler colonialism as defining structural realities in the United States. Things like the relationships among militarization, racialized policing, and the ideologies of the far right. The relative absence of those deeper questions reflects the relative exclusion from the conversation of individuals who bring critical and grassroots perspectives. That is people whose wisdom and practical experience on the front lines of struggles for justice might lead them to interrogate the categories, the narratives and the assumptions found in daily news reports. And we're very excited to have with us tonight four such individuals uh, joining us for this panel. So first we're joined uh, and very happy to be joined by Dr. Damon Berry, an assistant professor of religious studies at St. Lawrence University and a specialist in the intersections of race, religion and politics in the United States. Dr. Berry is the author of Blood and Faith, Christianity in American White Nationalism, which was published in 2017 by Syracuse University Press. And he also has a forthcoming book on Christianity and the alt-right, which will be published by Routledge. Damon, welcome. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having me. And I'm very happy to be uh, surrounded by such uh, wonderful uh, guests. Um, so uh, as uh, John already noted, uh, my area of specialty is thinking about especially the political right and the far right in the United States and the intersections they have with religion, which are many. Um, <clears throat> so if I wanted to highlight some things from the outset from what I've seen so far, um, one, it's my uh, consistent uh, refrain that the right, even the far right, even if we were to isolate it to white nationalism as a particular movement in the far right, is not monolithic. And what we saw at the Capitol was a convergence of a lot of different kinds of groups coming together around a common cause, um, acting uh, somewhat coordinatedly, but uh, uh, more or less spontaneously, something quite similar to what happened in Charlottesville with the Unite the Right rally. Um, and uh, what we're seeing now is some of the same sort of effects that is internal splintering, finger pointing, um, and a highlighted uh, interest in their presence and the kind of damage they can do. We're already seeing that with the present administration, uh, highlighting domestic violent uh, extremists um, as a national security policy for FBI and Homeland Security. So there are all sorts of implications for uh, the, the language and the policies put in place in the war on terror uh, being used potentially against these new domestic targets. Uh, it's also brought, drawing attention to the, uh, the presence of law enforcement, uh, elected officials, 
and military, both active and former military in these groups. So in these groups, I mean militia groups, so-called patriot movements, various white nationalist movements and other expressions of what we would describe as fascist movements. Something that has been long discussed uh, is at least as early as a 2006 um, FBI report, which was heavily redacted detailing uh, white supremacist involvement in local police. Uh, so that's now uh, a point of public conversation that's worth discussing. And the other aspect I would wanna perhaps talk about if questions arise is how religious communities are responding to this because this is all happening at a moment when Southern Baptist Convention uh, members are withdrawing because of debates over how the, the uh, convention's handling white supremacy, the role of critical race theory in seminary training, uh, and the ongoing political support for the religious right, um, and how some involved in more conservative evangelical denominations are not quite happy with that continued support. So those are the things that I think about the most and that I think converged on January 6th and continue to be a point of conversation for those communities I explained. Thank you, Damon. Thank you very much. Second, we're happy to welcome this evening, uh, Nicole Eichbrett. Nicole is a community organizer and a policy advocate who's committed to building a better world through the lenses of social, racial, and economic justice. Uh, she's currently the director of community organizing for the Community Action Agency of Somerville where she's partnering with working class and low income tenants to prevent evictions during the COVID-19 crisis and also to further the housing justice movement. Nicole is also an abolitionist organizer with the Asian American Resource Workshop and she organizes within the Chinese adoptee community of Boston. Raised in Western New York State, Nicole graduated from St. Lawrence University in 2014 with a double major in global studies and languages along with a minor in Chinese studies. Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much, John. It's so wonderful to be here this evening. And um, as John mentioned, I'm currently a community organizer and activist. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm also a queer, transracial, and transnational Chinese adoptee. Um, so that's the initial lens that I'm bringing to this conversation. And as a woman of color raised in a white family in a predominantly white community for most of my life um, and, and surrounded by many right wing and Trump supporters, uh, I can really affirm that the violence of tra and trauma of white supremacy runs deep. So the, the fascist attacks that occurred on January 6th um, are really symptomatic of something that's been brewing for a long time within our culture, not just from four years of Trump in office. And quite frankly, I don't see the possibility for unity, which is a term that I, I feel that, especially on the national level, our politicians are insisting we, we strive towards um, with people who do not see me as fully human and nor my friends or my comrades. Um, so this evening, I'll really be urging uh, people to examine their own privilege and kind of the role that they're playing to uphold white supremacy, because white supremacy is not only the, the blatant fascist attacks that we saw, but it's also embedded into our policies. It's when um, your neighbors in your community, uh, those who are most vulnerable to eviction or the COVID pandemic right now are all black and brown and working class or poor. Um, so white supremacy takes many different forms. And while we must demand that our elected officials take concrete action towards condemning and dismantling these systems, we also can't wait for broken legislative cycles for change to happen. And so I really feel that we must continue our movement building and especially for people who have oppressed identities and have been explicit targets of this type of violence. And we must be also investing in our own healing within our communities. Um, and, and from there really following the lead of those who, who've been the most harmed. So I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks for being here. Our third panelist uh, is Titan Mariam. We're very pleased that uh, Titan is here with us. Titan's a Bangladeshi American feminist, poet, community organizer, and activist who focuses on human rights, women's empowerment, and immigrant justice. She's the founder of the Bronx Mutual Aid Network, 
an entirely volunteer run community funded initiative that relies on donations to help those who are most vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that group has been providing free groceries, medicine and financial assistance to families in need since April, 2020. She's also the co-founder of Bangladeshi Americans for Political Progress and the Bangladeshi Feminist Collective. Titan graduated in 2012 from St. Lawrence University. Titan, welcome. Thank you so much, John and the Weave News for welcoming me into this conversation. It is so wonderful to be in community with everyone tonight. Um, I wish we were talking about something lighter. I wish we were speaking about something that, you know, wasn't as heavy as it is. Um, I think many of us that work in the community organizing activism space um, and just, you know, normally everyone is kind of reeling from what happened two weeks ago because it was a shock to everyone's system. The fact that there has not been an insurrection in this country um, since 1893, I believe, and then now in 2021. And so I think a lot of what we're witnessing in the post aftermath of this insurrection is really understanding um, in the global landscape and the, in the historical landscape of how we will remember these moments, how we'll, we will actually um, understand what exactly happened to the extent that um, a white supremacist movement was given a platform and a voice by the most powerful person in US uh, political establishment. So I think there's a lot to break down when it comes to how did we get here? What, what actually triggered this? As a community activist and organizer, am I surprised? No, I'm not. Because we have been seeing how there has been growing polarization happening within the US the for the past four years of Trump, um, we have been fighting against so many harmful policies that have affected communities of color from the Muslim ban to um, DACA being threatened to public charge and so many other policies that have really targeted immigrants in this country and um, it's it's just, I think what is most shocking and hard to really fathom is the fact that these individuals were even allowed to storm the Capitol in this way with the help of police forces, with the help of those that we believe are supposed to protect us, but they weren't. Um, I live here in the Bronx. I have been organizing and living in the Bronx uh, for, uh, almost 15 years now. Um, I mean, I've lived here for over 20 years, but you know, have been organizing locally in my community for 15 years. I am in the district where my representative in Congress is Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And um, I'd like to highlight some of the issues that she has brought up. The fact that my Congresswoman did not feel safe during this insurrection, the fact that she could not trust her fellow colleagues um, to not reveal the, her location, the fact that we have moles within the system, the fact that white supremacy is an institutional problem that is deeply, deeply rooted um, within so many folks that hold, currently hold power and positions within the US government. And we really need to acknowledge and understand that the systematic injustices um, is really rooted to racial, a, ra a lack of racial understanding in this country, a lack of racial reckoning in this country. The fact that um, we are not even having conversations around how do we heal from the traumas of slavery, the trauma of how indigenous people in this country were pillaged in order for America to be constructed. Um, there is so much deep and, and heavy history that has not been reckoned. And that's why, you know, for many of us, it's actually not shocking that such an incident, such as the Capitol riot attack occurred two weeks ago. Um, but I do think there's a couple of other factors that we need to investigate how media also has a role to play in um, not really uplifting how dangerous 
white supremacy is, how they have, they, the fact that was shocking was that, you know, a lot of people knew that there was a sort of coordinated planned attack uh, being organized by the alt-right and yet we kind of allowed it to transpire, right? And and this, we it should have never gotten to the level it had. I think the other aspect of the conversation that we need to really uplift is around accountability, transparency, and really making sure that the folks that were part of the insurrection are um, definitely held accountable and not for really minor charges such as trespassing, but actually being held accountable for the violence that ensued and the massacre that could have happened had the situation gotten um, out of control. So I am really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. There's so much to discuss. Um, and thank you so much, John, for holding the space. Thank you for being here with us, Titan. Finally, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, to our panel, Dr. Steve Peraza, an assistant professor in the Department of History and Social Studies Education at SUNY Buffalo State College. Steve earned his PhD in US history from SUNY Buffalo, specializing in African slavery in global perspective. His research examines slaves' conceptions of law and legal procedure in 18th century Louisiana freedom suits. Other research interests include race and racism in America, the Harlem Renaissance, and the long civil rights movement. He teaches courses on US history, African American history, the African diaspora, slavery in the Atlantic world, and hip hop. Steve, welcome, it's great to have you here. Sorry, Steve, I think we're not getting your audio. I'm not hearing Steve. Are others able to hear Steve? No? Okay. So Steve, I wonder if we might need to have you um, reconnect your audio that might require leaving the leaving the webinar and then coming back in and then when you come back in make sure that you um that your that your audio connects i'm not sure if um maybe perhaps one of the other panelists might be able to assist with that or perhaps um skylar okay while we're waiting for steve um to join us one thing I'd like all of us to be thinking about, and this is perhaps a question that I'll pose um, after we've had a chance to hear from Steve, is the question of the media coverage of the events of January 6th, um, the way that those events were framed, the kinds of questions that are being asked, the kinds of questions that are not being asked, and so on. Uh, and so that's something to mull over, uh, and perhaps we'll, we'll discuss that uh, briefly after we hear from Steve, and then we'll turn to some questions from the audience. Steve is back with us, I think. Still not getting your audio, unfortunately. I think we're gonna to need to continue working on that. In the meantime, I'm wondering, uh, Damon, Nicole, Titan, if any of you might want to offer some thoughts on that question of the media coverage in particular, um, both the way that the events were covered, but also perhaps some things that you would like to see uh, addressed more directly, more completely, uh, in a more contextual way in the media coverage of these issues. Damon, go ahead. Yeah, if I, if I can say, um, um, I, I, I wonder if the majority of the American public is getting something beyond sort of exactly what we got with Charlottesville of what an aberration all of this is. And what I'm struck with in thinking about the history of white 
nationalist movements or movements connected to white supremacy or militia movements that have constantly tried to respond to saying they're not white nationalists, they're not white supremacists, is how absolutely common um, it has been in American history. Um, so prior to 9-11, uh, the most significant in terms of casualties, uh, terrorist attack on US soil um, was co committed by Timothy McVeigh, um, who was equally inspired by his time uh, and his connections with Aryan Nation, his reading of the Turner Diaries, which has come up again in media discourse, um, but also inspired by the FBI's response to uh, Waco. Uh, he was sitting on the hood of his car outside of Waco selling bumper stickers, uh, advocating for arming oneself and protecting uh, oneself with the Second Amendment to protect oneself from the American government. And then, of course, the, the bombing in Oklahoma City was on the anniversary of Waco. And this all starts off because of the, in part, uh, because of the debacle at the uh, Weaver residence with the FBI siege of uh, Randy Weaver's uh, family's uh, uh, home. Um, and, and, you know, you could keep walking this back in American history, that this is not an aberration at all. And I'm concerned that like uh, the Unite the Right rally, people will wipe their brow and say, my goodness, that was frightening. Thank God that doesn't happen all the time. When in fact, this has been remarked upon for quite some time for people who study these things as the most serious domestic security threat there is by far, way more than any other locus of, of terrorism in the United States and um, its connections within the military, not just simply military people participating, but military people uh, uh, hurting people on bases, which is not unheard of, right? So criminal activity done by active duty members. And for example, um, someone uh, connected to a group called Adam Waffen, neo-Nazi terrorist organization, um, being investigated by the Joint Terrorism Task Force for calling out his unit's whereabouts in Turkey so they could be attacked. Uh, he's being prosecuted for that. So this sort of thing is not an aberration. Um, this particular event, of course, is specific and particular in its own way. But I'm concerned that the media attention will not draw those connections like they should be drawn. And I hope that wasn't too much to go into all, all of a sudden. That's what I'm thinking about. Well, thanks, Damon. Those are those are essential points, right? I mean, context, as we we often discuss at Weave News, is is often in short supply, right? In in kind of establishment mainstream uh, news media coverage, and the context that you're providing there, I think, is um, really key. Um, Titan, Nicole, right? Any um, on and, this? and to add on to Damon, you know, it's also we need to think about how biased the media is, right? As a Muslim organizer, as someone from um, a very diverse Muslim community in America, the fact is whenever there's coverage of any form of violence and it is a Muslim person, all, all right away, you know, it's linked to the war on terror, it's linked to terrorism. And whereas we've seen in the case of white supremacists, you know, um, folks that commit, commit acts of domestic violence, um, often it has been the sort of lone white male per person who is always um, identified with his or, her, his or her mental health, um, lack of mental health wellness, right? Um, but whereas on the flip side of it, you know, anytime it is anyone who is from the Muslim community, all right away, the word terrorism, terrorist is thrown out. And I think um, to Damon's point about really investigating the media's usage of language in this time is really important because of the fact that, um, you know, many of us were quick to say this is an act of domestic terrorism, but domestic, even identifying it as such links it to the war on terror, which ident which directly links it to Muslims, right? And 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 kind of this pol pol politicized um, version of Islam, right? Which was kind of, which has a lot of roots within um, U.S. military. I really being able to. Um, justify, you know, their sort of interventionalist 
approach to going into Muslim countries and kind of using um, terrorism as a form of invasion, right? So I think we really need to be wary of what sort of terms we're using, what the media is using. Um, and I think it's really alarming because the way that that day rolled out, it was, you know, there was a lot of shock, but I think also it almost seemed as though the media was like, look, just just another day at the capital of these folks that, you know, stormed the 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 building and here they are with police officers taking selfies and you know as a person of color as a muslim organizer i was just you know in shock because of the fact that if it had been any people of color if it had been muslims you know that had participated in such an act of violence you know right away there would be severe consequences but the media um did not necessarily highlight right away, you know, that there needs to be severe, severe consequences for these actions. Um, so these are just some of the things I'm thinking about when it comes to the media's role in really holding um, space for this conversation around domestic violence, how deeply seated the roots of white supremacy are, how there's so many incidents of white supremacists, you know, in movie theaters and schools and all these places, as Damon mentioned, there's a whole history of it in America. And we have seen that history of violence that goes unaddressed within the criminal justice system manifest in white folks, uh, white supremacists who think it's okay and it's within their right to go and ca cause such harm and um, almost, you know what, something that was shocking to me was the fact that people were on Facebook Live. Pe people were openly showing their faces, you know, people wanted to be identified. People had their work IDs on. People, um, you know, from the military had their military jackets on that had their battalion numbers on. They're, that is just alarming because this just means that you are not afraid of the consequences. And I think to um, juxtapose between what's been happening with racial just and mo justice movements in America um, during this past summer with the George Floyd protests, um, you know, often for activists and people of color to show up in a protest is really putting yourself in harm because you just don't know how and when you will be um, identified or if, if there's going to be any sort of repercussions of going to march peacefully at a protest. Whereas in this situation, the media just displayed white supremacists just coming into the space with complete, completely this sort of um, unabashed pride you know as though it's within their right and i think these are the things i'm thinking about at, of when i think about you know how did the media really cover this insurrection if you're just joining us welcome to this it's a special uh weave news live broadcast examining the january 6th attack on the u.s capitol and its implications for uh grassroots struggles for justice struggles against fascism struggles against white supremacy uh, we have four panelists with us and we welcome your questions. If you're with us on Zoom or Facebook, feel free uh, to add questions in the Q&A uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. And we'll do our best to gather those and, uh, and, and try to have the panelists address as many of those as possible. Uh, Nicole, thoughts on the media coverage? Yeah, um, I think Damon did a great job just contextualizing the history of white supremacy and um, insurrection in, in the United States. And um, just to build off what Titan was saying, I agree that there have been um, not enough critical comparisons between the treatment of this coordinated militarized violence um, and also the way law enforcement, like the Capitol Police especially, um, reacted, if not facilitated, uh, the, the riot itself. Um, versus the way demonstrators in the Black Lives Matter and racial justice uprisings um, and the, the violence they then received. Um, you know, I think it was called out on a surface level in, in many media outlets, but I'm really enraged at the thought that this is now being used to justify further investments in policing, militarization, and surveillance. Um, because fundamentally, the people who stormed the Capitol are a symptom of our society and culture that worships state violence 
militarization and is just kind of willing to keep throwing police at a problem expecting it to be solved that way. Um, so if anything, I think this furthers the urgency for abolition and shifting resources away from state violence. Um, and then again, like the most obvious examples being our loss enforcement, um, our corruption system and um, national security that's being, um, you know, pushed under under the, the phrase of, of, yeah, national state security. Um, and I think the other conversation that uh, the media especially, but a lot of folks who may identify even that's just liberal, if not left, are not ready to have is um, we, what does accountability look like and what are going to be the consequences and growth out of that? Because um, maybe Damon, you might know more about this than me, but you know, I, I have a, a, an understanding that a lot of white supremacist radicalization occurs within prisons. Um, and this, these are hotbeds for recruitment into neo-Nazism and so much else. So uh, I don't know what comes next from there, but I don't think anyone's talking about it. Yeah, that's that's an important point, um, that prison tends to be a site of radicalization. Um, but uh, equally so for the initial actions, uh, online spaces. So for instance, uh, Dylan Roof was radicalized online and took it upon himself to murder those people uh, in his words because nobody else was doing anything. Um, Bowers, the person who committed the Tree of Life shooting, actually tweeted that he was going in, screw your optics, because Trump wasn't going far enough. Um, and, and so, you, you know, online spaces are spaces of radicalization. Um, and then if they go to prison, uh, what's waiting for them there is an incredibly racialized, racially segregated, your skin is your uniform sort of space, um, where there might be more criminal organizations that use uh, whiteness as a, as a badge of belonging. Um, but certainly, um, if we don't have uh, institutions where learning and rehabilitation is is something that's a focus what you have is more hardened more seasoned experienced criminals with networks um coming out and you know and the prospect of that in the history of terrorism more broadly speaking uh can be quite frightening um you know especially if you know for instance aryan brotherhood they're they're selling drugs doing hits for mafia to accumulate a, a fortune and then being organized in such a way as they're really hard to break up and that that you know can serve as as their grassroots for organization for something much more militarized and dangerous yeah thanks for making that connection um you know one of the things that i've noticed just to just briefly about some of the um, media coverage is that you know even when there is an acknowledgement of some of these kind of issues, okay, well, there may be issues with white supremacy and law enforcement, and there may be issues, right? But then in other, you know, later in the in the broadcast, you hear a report that just sort of discusses the police as if they're a neutral force that as long as we have enough of them, we can, we can solve this problem, right? So it's like the, the news organizations are not making those connections and allowing those to really inform in a deeper way, um, the reporting that they're doing. And that's, that's been pretty clear to me in the coverage of this event and, and, and before as well. Um, is, uh, is Steve with us? I want to see if we have a chance to try to bring Steve um, back in. Looks like he's not joining us at the moment. Okay, well, we'll, we'll try to jump back to him um, in a bit. So um, we are welcoming your questions um, from folks who are joining us either on Zoom or uh, on Facebook. Uh, first question we have is, how can we prevent young folks from being recruited by these groups? I know so many kids fall into this. That's a question that came in um, from Facebook. Anyone have an interest in trying to address that one? Um, sure, I'll, I'll take a first uh, take of that question. Um, so again, I, I grew up in um, rural Western New York State. Uh, I lived in the suburbs of the Rochester area and then um, from like middle school and high school is more in the rural Finger Lakes small community uh, where everyone kind of knew each other. And so my community, 
often ranged in the um, conservative to the far right Trump supporting um, Confederate touting um, type families and students. Like I had classmates um, who would, you know, drive their trucks or tractors to school proudly displaying their Confederate flags. And that was just accepted as completely normal. And, and looking back at it, again, as, as a person of color within this community, I mean, at the time I didn't have the language and the analysis to understand um, what more was going on here. But I think it's really important um, at the broadest level, you know, we need to be in investing more intentionally into education. And I, I know that's, that's going to be difficult because of the way um, you know, education is managed at the national level and then states and then within districts themselves. Um, but like Titan uh, mentioned in the beginning, there needs to be a racial reckoning. There needs to be embedded education from, from the start and an understanding of the, the true facts of the history of the founding of this country, um, that it's a settler uh, colonial genocidal state. And we need to be um, helping students, you know, look at these mythologies of patriotism and nationalism and um, you know putting remember the context of these events so they can't be continually whitewashed by these these white supremacist myths um, and you know beyond that um, I think it's really important that beyond investing in education we're also investing in um, like housing healthcare, a living wage economy things that make our communities healthy and stable uh, because when people and families are desperate and living on the brink, that's when authoritarianism becomes appealing. Uh, that's when these quick solutions um, of, of violence and kind of turning against other people who look different than you becomes more appealing. And so um, that I feel like that's kind of a, the broadest level what we need to be doing to, to support um, youth and trying to divert them from these types of paths. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to jump in to kind of add to what Nicole is saying, because it really does start at home. You know, often um, conversations around race and racial justice and et cetera, I don't really hear about it from even my white friends, you know, because many feel that they live in a post-racial world. And that is a really um, sad reality, right? Where folks that are not affected by racial injustices on a day-to-day -day basis often do not see that it's an issue for many people still living within America, right? Um, and so I think it really starts with, you know, parents doing this work of what is racial justice? How do we teach our children to be much more aware of um, the fact that America is a very diverse country um i think there's a lot of you know this i think there's a sort of um difficulty around um american nationalism that is rooted in exceptionalism right the fact is um america is seen as this great sort of nation where you know we don't have all these issues that ha are, are bubbling under um our skin and i think that is something that needs to be corrected. Also the fact of um, people kind of downplaying their racist family members, right? Um, I've heard so many folks just being like, yeah, Thanksgiving is really hard because I have family members that will be like, you know, racist casually and I just have to like ignore it. And you know that, but ignoring it is the problem, right? Because you still, we all have a job to do and the job is to address um, the violence right from the beginning, because if you don't address your racist grandpa at Thanksgiving dinner, the young folks that are in the room, the young, um, you know, family members are going to think this sort of behavior is okay and it's normalized. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that everyone's going to become this like sort of aware woke person who has like this analysis and class analysis and racial justice analysis, but we do need to start, you know, we need to be correcting um, the people that are within our circles. And that is how younger folks will learn that, 
you know, what's right between um, treatment of folks. And I think one of the biggest issues for young folks that, you know, end up being um, victim to these groups is a lack of, uh, a lack of, um, a lack of actual uh, connection to communities of color, right? So as Nicole mentioned, and even for myself, you know, I grew up in New York City all my life. And when I went to St. Lawrence, it was the first time I was in a place where, you know, I was surrounded by majority white people, you know, and 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 I can, and that was uh, something that I had to adjust to and I had to learn how to operate in that sort of framework. But I think often um, there are young white youth that are growing up without you know, access to people of color. And so there's whatever they're learning, they're learning from their parents and they're learning from whatever they're picking up in school. So I think um, definitely there's a lot of work that needs to be done within families and within um, the com local communities that people live in, but also, yes, definitely really speaking uh, frankly about the history of America, right? And then straying away from this, American exceptionalism that we're made to believe. Amy, if I could bring you in here for a moment, we also got another question about mil sort of recruitment in the military. Um, so I'm just going to read that question out because it's clearly connected with what with with what Nicole and, and Titan have been talking about. Question is: To what extent is the military a site of radicalization? Um, I heard that one in five of the people arrested were former military. What are your thoughts on that, Damon? Um, it's it's actually an old discussion. Um, so something that was a common question at a certain time, and it may still be, uh, was if you if you were wanting to join the military, you would be asked if you belong to any radical organizations at any point in time in history, of your personal history, um, and KKK, Aryan Nations, those names would be brought up to you. Um, and in the context of the war on terror, um, that question became politicized in a certain direction. So for example, in 2009, Daryl Johnson was a Department of Homeland Security analyst who released, his department released a report exactly about this, that uh, returning veterans uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan were vulnerable for recruitment. Um, the report received a ton of right-wing backlash, uh, conservative responses to that report saying that, you know, that the, the DHS was accusing, but specifically Obama's DHS was accusing our, vet, our veterans of being terrorists. And of course, that's not what the report was saying. It was trying to detail that we did have an involvement with right-wing extremist groups in the military and trying to talk about that. And that department was dismantled, he was fired, and the report was crushed. And, and uh, Secretary Napolitano was forced to apologize publicly for it. Now, it was a report that began under the Bush administration, but it was released under the Obama administration. So the answer is, that's a good question, because a lot of the data that we could have gotten in the interim to explain how to answer that question exactly has been hidden under a pile of red tape and politicization that hasn't allowed us to ask that question, hasn't allowed us to do the research necessary to find out how vulnerable uh, the military actually is to this stuff. Um, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest that it is, it is a place where uh, people with these affiliations are going uh, for a lot of reasons, and in some cases for the training, and some cases for access to military supplies. Um, so to acquire black market uh, military supplies to use or to sell to acquire money. Um, so uh, I wish I could be more specific, but again, there's there. I think what's most compelling about that answer is that precisely that we haven't been able to find out very clearly because any answer to that is is immediately uh, attacked as um, being, uh, you know, labeling the troops as terrorists and and squashed. Is that an adequate yeah. answer? Yeah, thanks. I mean, these are these are essential questions, right? It's not I'm not surprised that the first couple of questions we got were, you know, related to these issues of of recruitment and radicalization and 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 so forth. Uh, Steve Peraza, are you with us? Oh, we're still not getting any sound, unfortunately. Okay, we'll keep working on that. 
I apologize for the for the technical uh, issues here. We'll keep working on trying to get Steve uh, so that he's able to join us. Um, please uh, add your questions, folks who are with us in the in the audience, whether on Zoom or on on Facebook. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists, uh, wanted to also ask about the issue of uh, community organizing in particular. We you know we have a couple of seasoned community organizers here with us. And I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on what are some of the specific lessons that community organizers can teach us right now um, in terms of how to address the problems that more and more people are now becoming aware of because of these events of, of January 6th. So if we turn to community organizers, what can we learn? Nicole, you wanna jump in first? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so a little bit what I've been mentioning in Titan as well is is really critical for, for to start with yourself, right? And to be thinking and reflecting through your own dimensions of privilege um, and constantly be doing this internal examination that might be uncomfortable, especially if you are white. And um, again, acknowledging if you've been complicit in white supremacy in the way that manifests itself within your family system, your friends and community, your workplace. Uh, and then moving beyond that, though, you really need to be listening and allowing those who have been most deeply harmed by this violence to lead and support their existing movements, um, rather than simply uh, starting your own coalition maybe. I mean, of course, in communities where that doesn't exist, then yes. Um, I, I have been very inspired, um, you know, during the last four years of Trump to see how much grassroots emerge, uh, organizing emerged in communities that did not have that. Um, but in these larger and more diverse communities, um, we should be following our Muslim friends and comrades who have been the targets of state surveillance. We should be investing in their leadership and um, becoming their allies and be willing to put our bodies on the line for them as we're doing with uh, black and brown organizers as well. Uh, but really you need to also be working within the systems and communities you exist in to make it a safer place for others who are different than you. Um, because things won't change if we just continue to be complacent and, and ignorant. Um, so it's not just enough to, to show up at rallies and mobilize, but you need to be organizing amongst your people and talking about these things. Um, and really trying to end this culture of, of having white supremacy be behind closed doors uh, because it still will manifest itself in, in the open. Yeah, and um, just to add on to that, you know, I think there definitely right now during this pandemic, you know, we're all in isolation. It has been very much difficult for people, but it has also allowed folks to find creative ways to form community digitally, virtual, and really reach out in a way that, you know, we have not been able to do before because people are tied up in many aspects of their lives. But I think um, one of the really most important lessons from community organizing during this pandemic has been to build locally and really focus on, you know, and it, it doesn't, when, we, when I say build locally, it doesn't mean that you have to organize your entire town or your entire city, right? You can start with something so simple and, and easy as your neighborhood, right? And I think, um, you know, what organizing allows for is for us to really have these conversations and, and bring the sort of perspectives that many people have and hold that space for folks to ask questions, you know, learn. And I think that's something that can be really um, impactful now that, you know, we're kind of dealing with this threat of white supremacist violence, right? And I think um, in terms of a lot of folks in the community organizing space, you know, that are white, white passing, white adjacent, really need to reckon with the fact that, you know, you have privilege and that privilege of being a white person should be probably utilized in a really impactful way to organize other white people, you know, because that's something that we don't think about is that we have this sort of um, mentality, right, that, you know, those are the oppressed people, people of color. And I, if I want to be a social worker, 
or if I want to be someone who's en enacting any sort of societal change, I must go and save them. But what we haven't reckoned, we what we haven't really reckoned with is the fact that white supremacy exists because who's organizing white people who are racist, you know, who's organizing locally in the communities and the churches and, you know, um, all these different sort of spaces where people are being radicalized, right? And, and really bringing those questions about accountability and conversation and dialogue, right? And, and allowing folks to have um, these open conversations. I think what's really alarming is obviously President, President, um, ex-President Trump, right? Being such a violent force that people um, really, you know, gravitated towards because of the fact that they need to be heard, right? There's a, there's a sort of a desire for people to have their issues um, addressed. And when they aren't, being addressed, right? When poor white folks in the Appalachian um, uh, areas, when folk, poor white folks in the Midwest are not getting healthcare, are not getting, you know, the food that they need to feed their family, they're not receiving adequate education, you know, they don't have stable employment, you know, they are looking for a scapegoat. And what Trump did was really violent um, and, and used communities of color as a scapegoat for that sort of to to um, really just like divert that attention right and I think what needs to happen is that we need to be organizing intersectionally on issue on a issue based um, praxis right and really bring class analysis into our organizing community organizing and build with intersectionally with other communities of color, white communities, black communities, indigenous communities, and really fight issues that people are facing societally. So I think, you know, when we think about where do we go from here, how do we really um, address the threat of white supremacist violence is to also remember the, the reality of it is that yes, there are white supremacists, but these are humans. you know, these are folks that have families that, you know, don't see themselves as like some form of monsters, right? They see themselves as law abiding citizens of some sort and 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 they're hurt. You know, I think where where the feelings of violence is coming from is from not having um, spaces to have these conversations and learn. So I think as a community organizer at this time, you know, responding effectively um, to this violence would mean to like really focus on organizing locally amongst white communities. And, and also, also another aspect of this is the digital presence, right? There are white supremacist pages, white supremacist um, websites, white supremacist apps, you know, and we really need to treat this um, issue how we treat, you know, how America has treated um, threats around national security when it comes to like Muslim countries and et cetera. Like that's how we need to treat these sort of spaces digitally that people are existing. And um, Damon mentioned radical radicalization that happens in the military, but radicalization is happening within our police forces. So many NYPD officers um, have been um, discovered on white supremacist, you know, forums and et cetera. And there needs to be actual consequences for such for such, you know, um, affiliations, right? So that people understand that if I'm going to go into public service, I am going into public service to protect everyone and not just white people are people that look like me. Thanks, Titan. I think we have a chance now to have Steve jump in. Uh, so uh, again, for folks who've, uh, uh, who are maybe just joining us, uh, we're speaking about the events of January 6th. We've been here with Damon Barry, Nicole Eigbrett, Titan Merriam, and again, we're happy to have Steve Peraza with us as well. Steve's an assistant professor um, at SUNY Buffalo State College. Uh, Steve, as a historian, someone who uh, writes and teaches about race and racism in America, uh, your thoughts as you listen to this conversation. Well, John, I'm boiling over here. I had to find an iPhone somewhere on this corner and run back in here and sign up for the meeting. I, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking that public school kids who don't have access to computers. Uh, I was just thinking about them because my little odyssey is really nothing to complain about, but I imagine that they're struggling in this digital world. 
with that aside, I, I just want to throw three things that I've been thinking about deeply. And I can't read what I wanted to because of time, but you know, I think there's a lot of race mongering going on on both sides that is entirely frustrating. We're doing comparative suffering again. And I don't think this is the time for that. And I've heard it, I've heard it in our webinar and I've certainly heard it in the in the news. Um, so by race mongering, I mean, you know, we're we're doing the if they were black, they would have been shot thing. And I don't know where that conversation is going to get us. So a big part of what we're doing is trying to figure out what next. That's been the conversation from the very beginning. And I, I think we need to nip that in the bud and, and move on toward another kind of ideology. Um, if we're, you know, if we're really going to resolve some of the issues that we saw. Uh, another issue that I've, I've been researching closely is police complicity in the in the siege. Uh, now, I, I don't love CNN's, the Trump insurrection, the, the 45 minute special that they did. I think it has a lot of that. Uh, it needs to be analyzed very carefully. Uh, but they do raise the question consistently throughout the show that police were actively, in some cases, actively helping the rioters. And I don't, I haven't really seen the study of this. I haven't seen much follow-up on this particular question. CNN was really delicate about it. I and mean, you could tell that they were hinting, but not saying it out loud. The elephant was in the room though. You know, we, we saw video footage of police stepping aside for rioters. So there had to be something going on with the police because you and I, we all kind of know the United States is a big deal. You know, the, it's, a, it's, it's a very strong state that doesn't allow its representatives to be attacked or, or to be in those kinds of positions. It was stunning to see um, what, a, what the rabble can do. And the last thing here, and I'm gonna be incredibly controversial with this one, but, and I said this for BLM protesters, right? Uh, we see the right to rebel. Like our government is founded on this kind of action. Now, where you stand in terms of the values of the people rebelling, that's a different story. But this country is, I mean, it's in our, it's in our declaration. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the foundations of our constitution that once we no longer consent to be governed the way that we're being governed, if, it, if violence is necessary, then we should even take up violence. Now, I am not in any way in support of the people who laid siege on the Capitol, but if we're going to reckon, we're, you know, we talked racial reckoning, um, if we're gonna reckon, we also have to reckon with the political values of the United States. And you know, for a moment, leave our identities aside and try to figure out if this is a government that we really want. Do we understand how our government works? Can we can we become better citizens um, so that we can actually prevent this somehow? Maybe maybe we can raise our children to compromise because I think right now compromise is is is, uh, is is gone. You know, we don't we don't really see that as part of politics anymore. We're all we're all you know, hiding behind our ideas or our identities or our, our, our policies, you know. So race mongering, police complicity, the right to rebel. I did have something that I really wanted to read uh, revolving around these three issues, but I feel really strongly about them. And thank you for my time. I apologize for having all of this technical difficulty. I, I... Oh, it's great to have you with us, Steve. And I hope that we'll actually have the opportunity to uh you know, give you a chance to, you know, bring those ideas in in more detail, perhaps uh, on the virtual pages of weavenews.org sometime in the near future. So we'll be in touch about that. Um, and, and please stay with us. We've got some great comments on Facebook, a number of interesting questions that have come in from folks here on Zoom as well. Uh, one question that came up that I wanted to share with the group uh, is this one, how can we avoid an expansion of the surveillance state in response to these events. Should we be concerned about a second Patriot Act of some kind geared towards fighting domestic terrorism, but increasing the state machinery that targets non-white people? That's a concern I've heard raised in, in, in uh, a number of contexts since January 6th, right? Mm -hmm. With the uh, calls that we've been hearing for a new struggle against uh, terrorism and so forth, right? And the tricky thing is, I can just editorialize here for a moment, right? Um, anytime you label something as terrorism, you're sort of implicitly saying, okay, we're gonna empower the state to come in and fight that. 
and we know historically that, that that's going to be carried out in particular ways that target certain communities. So I think that's what's a, uh, you know kind of underneath that that question. Um, anybody want to address that one? I'd like to. I'd like some face time. Why not? Yeah, please, I, Steve. The, the, I don't know if the I don't know if the siege on the U.S. Capitol is really what's galvanizing the state. I, I actually think the public health crisis is. And if we're if we're wondering, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's actually remarkable to wonder if there's going to be an increase in the surveillance state. I mean, we're it's definitely going to happen. You know, it's 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 part and parcel of this whole process. I think in 2020 and 2021, we've seen the consolidation of the state in an unprecedented way. And no one is going to shout foul when public health is what's at stake, right? But when you start to really look at how much states are doing and what kind of control that they've established over their citizens, um, it, it, um, it's not really hard to believe. It's kind of a logical conclusion that now we're going to be very, uh, we're going to be um, hunting down folks who are suspected of whatever it is. And, you know, we've had conversations in the past with, uh, about, you know, how easy it is to throw around the terms that we need to spike up enforcement. So terrorist is one of those terms, and, you know, or rioters is another one of those terms. It just galvanizes the state to move. Um, just, you know, I imagine that this is going to happen rather naturally. And then on top of it, no one's going to challenge it. You know, no one's going to challenge the need for uh, bigger guns in front of the Capitol now that thugs have come in and, you know, laid waste to it. So I, I, in, in many respects, I, you know, and I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but I've come to be one in the last couple of years. I'm starting to feel like there's something going on with uh, the police powers in this country. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an effort to really consolidate state control over citizens. And we're not, we're not stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, uh, and, and th those of us who are, are active in different issues. Um, uh, and I just, I'll, I'll finish here, you know, um, when are we gonna have our issues actually coalesce? You know, um, we, I've been in the, in, the, in the activist community organizing, um, trying, you know, helping to organize communities. And, you know, we always run up against these problems where different, we have these different interests and these different interests are connected to uh, bigger identities, you know? Well, when are, when are we going to find a language that allows us to bring those issues together? I mean, I think Black Lives Matter has been the most effective at actually trying to create that, uh, you know, that that unity among different um, stakeholders. But you know, you know how I feel about this as well. I, I think using the Black racial identity is is actually a problem there, right? Like it's it it gives an excuse for folks who aren't ready to to be racialist. Uh, you know, it gives them an excuse to kind of close the door, or it might even alienate some people. It might alienate some people who don't identify that particular way. So the best organization or the best groups of organizations, I think, for bringing together all of these different issues also has something in it that's inherently divisive, unfortunately. I mean, but it, you know, or at least I see it that way. So there's, you know, so will the state actually increase the surveillance? I mean, I, I imagine so. Uh, but what are we going to do? How are we going to actually bring together folks? I mean, I, I would love to hear what the uh, from, what the community organizers think because I, I imagine you're finding these contending forces. Like, what do you do in order? Like, this panel discussion is one step, right? But how do you when 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 the rubber meets the road? Like, what is that conversation you're doing? What is the language you're using? Uh, how do you keep people engaged? Um, in an issue that's not necessarily their specific issue, but it's an issue that affects all humanity. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a lot about, you know, and I was just speaking about this, like building intersectionally across the board on issues, right, that people are facing. You are absolutely right, Steve, that there is a public health crisis going on right now. And coronavirus does not discriminate based on like, you know, what the color of your skin is or like how much money you make or whatever it is. Um, and I think speaking to people about the reality of this public health crisis that's affecting everybody um, will bring a lot of folks to the table to be like, okay, we are actually all collectively suffering and we do need to 
fight for a system that is going to benefit everybody, right? Um, and I have seen a bit of a shift, right? In even because there's amongst like um, people in my network that have some form of um, some form of security, right? Financial security. They weren't thinking about racial justice. They were not thinking about you know this public health crisis because they were not affected by it. But now, because of the fact that coronavirus has affected everybody, people are much more aware that you know. Um, communities of color are suffering disproportionately and I think you know people are looking to be activated which is which is actually um really optimistic right um to to kind of think about where do we how do we continue building um in terms of so the so the question around surveillance definitely there's going to be an increase um as a Muslim organizer we have seen this you know after 9-11 when you know there as soon as this um, act of violence was committed. Our mosques were surveilled to till date. There were, you know, informants that were just sprinkled into our community spaces. Um, folks that, you know, we knew and we still know and we were we were building with for years that end up ended up being an FBI informant, right? So I think surveillance is something that communities like um, mine are very much aware of, and I think we really do need to uh, dictate, you know, um, and, and fight against this increased surveillance into the spaces we occupy, right? And I think when we think about expansion of the surveillance nation, uh, nation we really need to um, also understand, you know, we're living in a technological world and where that surveillance is really going to come in is in our in in the ways that we're also organizing digitally so a lot of the conversations that activists and organizers are having now is how do we protect ourselves in the digital realm how do we make sure that you know um whatever we might be working on is not somehow misinterpreted or co-op like it's just these are the things that we need to think about when it comes to surveillance because we know that um as leftist organizers that some of the organizing we're doing around abolition around mutual like even mutual aid which is like considered political work right because what is mutual aid it's a failure of government to provide and so like the community comes in and, and performs that um that operation and so I think, you know, when it comes to surveillance, it's a lot about like, you know, securing a lot more resources for digital digital security for activists and organizers from communities of color to be able to do this work. Um, I don't, I, I can't speak to, you know, whether we're going to see a second Patriot Act and how that's actually going to, you know, roll out um, when it comes to fighting, fighting domestic violence within America, but I surely hope not. But I do think we need to be having a lot more conversations on digital security and like protecting ourselves online. Can I make a quick follow up there? I wanted to give a shout out to the, to the um, can you hear me? Yeah, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Never mind. Nicole, I know you've done a lot of abolitionist work. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this question of sort of how to organize around issues of state surveillance, um, you know, in ways that might help uh, build connections across, you know, lines of difference. Yeah, I, yeah, I've been reflecting on this as we've been talking, um, because for, for three years I worked in the Massachusetts State Legislature and um, facial recognition technology and the use of that as a surveillance and criminalization tool has been actively um, in the forefront of uh, communities and, and legislative matters. So one thing I, it, it's challenging because on one hand, um, you know, our, our governments have failed us in so many ways. And so there's absolutely, um, you know, the, the, the thought of thinking within leftist communities that take a much who take a much more anarchist perspective and just explicitly do not want to engage with establishment political systems and will purely be working from a place of community defense and mutual aid and absolutely that needs to continue happening um but 
you know, I, I'm of the opinion that we still need to be uh, demanding better policies and protections from our government. Um, because when we become so cynical about that, we stop showing up. And we should be insisting that these uh, like resources and supports within our community are, are available and then really fight and demand for that. Because um, it was pointed out to me today um, that in Somerville, the city where I live, which is just outside of Boston, um, despite the, the eviction crisis due to coronavirus and um, you know, devastating loss of, of jobs and everything else, um, evictions, at least in my community, have declined um, because we have more resources than ever. Um, granted, it's not being implemented in, in a really equitable or functional way, but we have more resources now for rental assistance and housing stabilization and homelessness prevention than had ever been uh, available in years. And, um, you know, back to your, your mention, our mention though of surveillance, I also think, you know, while we need to be thinking about this happening on a national scale, there are pushes that we can make locally. Like our city council, I believe this past year, passed an ordinance and resolution to ban the use of facial recognition software. Like we need to be starting at the municipal level. I know it's not as flashy as Congress or making demands of President Biden, but that's where the change happens too. And so what I've been really um, inspired by and, and um, really wanting to support and see more of too is um, in our abolitionist communities in Boston, there's really um, this fight for participatory budgeting. And again, decentralizing these processes. So it's not purely within the hands of electeds who we witnessed unfortunately do not always fully represent the, the demands of people, especially those who've been most oppressed. And so um, we have organizers um, from groups called uh, Families for Justice Healing and, and Black and Pink, um, both abolitionist organizations who are doing organizing within communities and, and teaching, um, you know, co-learning and building, you know, visionary budgets with current and formerly incarcerated people and, and budgets that really reflect our values because that's fundamentally what they are. We're going to leave a little bit of time at the end to talk about next steps, but there's one other question that came in that I, I think would be interesting to um, to pose at this point, and I'll, maybe I'll toss it over uh, first to Damon. The uh, question is, how can we engage with those who think that our problems are resolved by the election of Joe Biden? Many in the resistance were only politicized insofar as it meant getting Trump out of office. What strategies can we use to show these sorts of people that the work is far from finished? Well, I mean, that same sort of discussion was happening when Obama was elected. So we can point to recent history and recent experience of history um, that uh, we've had this same sort of baseless optimism before, um, that we still have Trump being incredibly popular among Republicans. We still have Trumpism far from over. Um, and the kinds of policies, if one can call them such, uh, talking points that he was throwing out there are not becoming extinct because he failed. They're not becoming extinct because the Republicans didn't get control of the House. They're not becoming extinct because they lost the Senate. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, many of those uh, uh, politicians who ran on Trump and Trumpism, even as in 2015, they were distancing themselves from him and saying he was wholly unfit for office, haven't wavered one iota in many ways from those very same talking points. So there's absolutely no reason to believe in any shape or form that we're reaching a giant turning point. If anything, we're reaching a point of potentialities in the plural. And I think it reaches across many different issues um, the potential for racial justice is there, but the potential for a backlash is there. Uh, the potential for it getting worse and people not acknowledging that it's getting worse because Biden's in office is there. The potential for the kinds of surveillance and, and policing that can happen to stem what is a very real potential threat in extreme right-wing violence uh, here in the United States. Um, is also the same potential that when the political winds change, those tools developed to attack that threat will be turned against others. 
there's every reason to believe that that can absolutely happen. So we're at a point of potentiality uh, where things, certain things are possible, uh, but we were also here before when we thought we had turned this giant corner. And the language of turning the corner of a post-racial era was actually used to silence efforts to deal with our racial past, uh, to lionize the American state as exceptional. And so I, I, I don't think there's any reason that anybody should ever expect that somehow something radical has shifted. It hasn't. That's just my feeling anyway. Others like to jump in on that on that question regarding the election of Biden, the future of Trumpism, you know, the the entire political dynamic there. Yeah, um, I'd like to just, you know, it's it's a privilege to think that you know the work is done because Trump is out of office, right? Um, and I think this sort of neoliberal approach to understanding the world is just unacceptable. Um, I think more so than ever, this form of apathy should not be allowed to be even entertained because of the fact that, you know, right now, coronavirus being this global public health crisis, the fact that, you know, there's so much um, joblessness in this country, the fact that, people are struggling to feed their families. These are issues and crises that all have not been averted and are not going anywhere. You know, we're going to be living with the reality of, um, of, of what all of this means in the next few years, right? We don't know when the pandemic is going to end because does a vaccine mean that everything is safe and people can go and like, you know, continue with their lives? No, it does not. So I think, really taking yourself away from this sort of perspective of understanding the world as like, well, I needed, I need to be activated because of Trump is um, something we need to be moving away from and understanding that, you know, building solidarity, building like this it, within move, movements means that understanding um, there's so many other crises and issues that need to be addressed for um, within within America for so many communities, right? Um, immigrant communities, indigenous communities, there's so many fights to fight. And that I, I, what I'm hoping for is that that sort of energy that was created as a result of Trump continues um, despite Biden being in office, right? And 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 we've we're already seeing, you know, Biden has inherited a presidency that is one of the most difficult ones um, since like the Great Depression, right? And, and, and there's a lot of work to be done and everyone who has been activated against Trump also need to continue being activated and not take this neoliberal approach to um, organizing or, or kind of taking a back seat now that Trump is out. Steve, thoughts on, on that? No pressure if you don't want to jump in, but sorry, we just need you to unmute there. Is it okay for me to jump in here? Absolutely. Um, a humane vision of cross-racial solidarity. A humane vision of cross-racial solidarity. See, what I'm into right now, what's moving next for me is creating an ideology that can replace the ideologies that are toxic for us in our society. One of those ideologies to me is race. race. And I feel like we've gone as far as we're gonna go down that road. I, mean, I don't, I firmly believe that you can't really use race to defeat racism. We need something new, something more creative, something that unifies us so that we don't have many, many struggles. You don't have to turn off my struggle to go help your struggle. You know, rarely do we talk, we, we talk intersectionality is the coolest word but it's so difficult to actually operationalize. And then intersectionality stops being talked about once you leave the classroom or once you leave the boardroom. So I think for, really the, for, for the next steps, especially, we, we should actually thank uh, Trump for eliminating apathy. I thought one of the great things about this election is how many people actually showed up to vote. You know, I was just beating this drum on Facebook all day. Just vote, just vote. I don't really care who you vote for, but as a citizen, especially if you pay taxes, you should be voting. I think our civil society showed up 
for the election. You know, I don't think enough has been, I don't think we celebrated the United States people enough for what they did in that election. Look how wonderful it was. I mean, it took forever to get the results, but you know, we got a winner. Uh, it went through all of these different political processes, but validated. I mean, people even tried to take over Congress to stop this election and still, you know, the, the, the country survived. Now, I'm, I guess in my old age, I'm turning into a nationalist, but I think we can uh, start to develop better ideologies to lead our society. Uh, I think we need to really get our, you know, if you're in the classroom, for me, you know, it's talking to students about what it is that, uh, what, what it is that makes your citizenship whole, what it is that makes the United States in your mind, how do you define this, this, this government, you know, and really down to the basics, you know, helping out our people to design a country that they actually want to be, you know, uh, we're, we're always criticizing our country. I think there's lots of criticism. I'm a black man in America, you know, but we haven't had conversations about what we're, what we think and what we value there's something that can replace these other Idea, and I don't mean to, to minimize race or racism uh, by saying ideology, but I do mean to say this is something that we use to describe and define the world that we see. It's not a transhistorical inherent thing. We're still not treating race that way. We're treating race like it's, you know, blood. So I really want to, I've really been pressing a lot to develop some kind of ideology that can unify people across different identities and different uh, political positions and really trying to lift the veil up on these ideologies that we that we throw around as if they're common sense, you know, but they all have histories and they've all changed over time to accommodate very specific contingencies in the society. So I think this is one time where society is in crisis and we can throw some new ideas out there that might stick. Maybe we actually have a human rights movement. Maybe we actually see humanitarianism. It might have a different name. It might have a different way of, of, of being presented. But I think this is the time for us to, to enter into the marketplace of ideas and reclaim our, our nation from the head to the heart, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, and in, in, in that spirit, uh, you know, as we were preparing for this discussion, I, I encouraged each of the panelists to think about, you know, sort of specific actions that people can take right now to support the kinds of efforts and the struggles that that we've been talking about. Um, and, and we hope to sort of pool those ideas, the more specific, the better, and, and share them with our readers at Weave News in an article, you know, after this panel, get them out on our social media channels and so forth. So uh, I'm gonna use my moderator's prerogative and, and, and take us out with this, you know, what's, what's always the most important question, what is to be done? Um, and so if we could quickly just go around, ask for at least a brief um, observation um, from each of our panelists tonight on this question of what are specific actions that people can take right now uh, to be a part of the solution here. So Nicole, let me start with you. What is to be done? Absolutely. So I have four calls to action um, for our community tonight. And the first to go back to what we've all been kind of insisting this, this panel is to not be complacent. Um, don't let this election of Biden um, lull you into complacency and political comfort. Um, please continue to talk to your family, your friends, your colleagues about white supremacy, about fascism, and, and look around your community and see how others are dealing with it, especially those who are people of color um, or in, in more marginalized identities. Um, my second offering is to invest in black and brown um, communities of color and organizations that are led um, with explicitly anti-fascist or abolitionist missions and working to dismantle state violence. Um, so in Boston, the Boston area, I recommend um, really investing in, in groups like the Muslim Justice League, uh, which is based in Boston, but leads the national um, Stop Countering Violent and Extremism Network. Uh, we have Families for Justice is Healing, as I mentioned, as well as Black and Bink Boston, um, which are working to dismantle the, the carceral um, system. And then my third uh, offer call to action would be to join community defense efforts that are organizing and mobilizing against white supremacy. And so if you are in a position where you can be showing up in the streets and 
and you know taking direct action um, if not now is a really powerful network to be part of and they have chapters all over the country as well so it's really um, a movement of american jews and allies who are fighting anti-semitism and white nationalism um, and then fourth and finally thinking again about how we can engage with our government uh, if you haven't done this already look local so i really urge you to to reach out to your um, local city council or town and municipal government and insist that they pass a resolution condemning these fascist attacks and in turn white supremacy in all its forms. So that's just a place you can start, you know, Congress and, and national reforms might feel like a long shot, but with enough support from your neighbors, you can start making a difference in your own backyard. Nicole Igre, community organizer in Boston, thank you so much. Damon Barry, what is to be done? Um, I think because of just way my subjectivity has been formed in my life experiences and how I've been signified and the career path that I've, ta I've taken, plural, um, I, I tend to fall back on the scholarly virtue of shut up and listen uh, a lot. Uh, because you think you know, and then you find out that you don't quite know. Um, so I, 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 just speaking for myself, starting from somebody who's not an activist, who's not been involved in activist work, my starting point for me would be listening to the people that are involved in the work, people listening to the people that are most hurt by these things and listening for where I can be of some help. And most importantly, I think coming with that listening is the ethical obligation to put your own self at risk, to put your own subjectivity at risk. The things that you think are valuable about yourself and your identity, to put those at risk, to hear the stories and hear the requests, to face the face the faces that are being hurt, and then allow yourself to be hurt too, uh, to put yourself in that position of precarity to experience it, because until you do that, you're not going to know what to do. You're going you're to run in there. You're going to do something probably not very helpful, usually in your own interests, and that's not what we need anymore. Uh, so from just if you're starting where I am, where I don't know what to do, I study the movements and I try to make them known and I try to explain some elements, but honestly, I wouldn't know what to do. So I'm starting from the place of listening and being, being willing to risk myself uh, for the benefit of the person who's being hurt. So that's just, that's the only place I know to start from because <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Not yet, but I'm hoping to learn. Thank you, Damon. That's, that's Damon, ba Damon Barry um, from the Religious Studies Department at St. Lawrence University. Let's turn to Steve Peraza. Steve, what is to be done? Well, first I need to unmute. Uh, next, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm hit hard by shut up and listen, like that, that's resonating with me. I took a diff, slightly different tack. Where mine is, you know, talk to your kids. Like talk to your kids' friends, talk to your younger siblings, talk to young people. The young people are the key. I know it's cliche and to say, you know, we do it for the kids. But, you know, I had a conversation with my son. And after a few minutes, I realized that he didn't have like one of the pillars of sexism, right? I grew up, I'm a, I'm a Latino and I'm a black man. Listen, I grew up in a, in a, in a kitchen where there was a difference between uh, boys and girls. And there was a hierarchy, a cultural hierarchy in the household around that. There were stereotypes about girls and stereotypes about boys and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And I spoke to my son for about five minutes and realized he doesn't have any of that. Like that is just not in his consciousness. Like he doesn't, that's fundamental to the way I grew up and the way my sex and my genders was, was expressed. And he's just not had, to, had that at all. And I take that to mean that slowly but surely, we're starting to whittle away, we're really striking at the root of patriarchy, striking at the root of sexism. That's yeoman's work. But I think the best thing that we can do is go to our kids and teach them the world that we want them to see. Like create that vision for them. 
you know, they'll be able, they're, they're, grown, they're brilliant. Our kids are brilliant. I, I think they're actually smarter than the adults because they don't have all this experience blinding them. They'll pick up on it and we'll find that 20 years down the road, our society is going to have at least some ideological and cultural improvements. And once we start thinking differently and believing what we think because we created it and we value it and we think it's honest, we think it unifies. Once we start doing that and the kids, we're going to have a great future. We're going to have a great world. Trust that. I was stunned with my son, my son you know, and I don't talk to my son about these. I don't, I don't talk in these ways. This discourse I don't really bring into the household. So I was really, really surprised and really thankful. I think society is changing. We're starting to see it in our, in our, in our pop culture. And if you go talk to your kids, or you talk to the kids, really, I think we'll, we'll be in, in great shape. We'll be in great shape. Steve Peraza from Buffalo State College, SUNY Buffalo State College, thank you for those words. And finally, last but not least, Titan Mariam in the Bronx. What is to be done? Um, I agree with everything everyone is saying, and I'll just um, add to it, right? I think right now, definitely speaking to Steve's point, the children and the youth are literally, I know we it, it is cliche to say they're the future, but literally they are the most justice oriented people that I know. And I have a lot of youth in my organizing circles because of the fact that I need to know what these 15, 16 year olds are thinking about because you know, for them, they're on social media. They are interacting with the news just in the same way we are. They are also going through the effects of the pandemic in a much more deeper way because of like how schooling and education has changed, right? So there's a lot of um, mental health issues, a lot of things that they're also dealing with. And and that is radicalizing them. That is making them want to see change and want to like really not accept, you know, politics as usual. Um, they don't see Biden as a savior. They do not see Biden as any form of savior. They're like very much um, thinking about the future. They're really much more aware and organized. And also, I think, um, you know they're really focusing on the issues that matter in a in a way that you know even myself as an organizer who's been doing this work for a while now aren't thinking about you know um they don't see electoral politics as the end-all be-all they don't see someone being elected into congress or city council or whatever it may, it may be as a form of justice necessarily you know but they are involved they are getting involved locally in campaigns because they do know that if they put socialist people um in power if they put people that understand what the issues are that we will that is how we're going to push policy that is how we're going to push budgets you know um as N N nicole said you know budgets are moral documents moral like for society to function with right the reality of it is the way that we allocate money our taxpayer dollars really does affect each and every one of us um because it really impacts you know how good the education is in the schools that we're going to how good the infrastructure is in the communities we live in um if there are green spaces etc places for kids to go and breathe and, and and during this pandemic you know these are things um that we're thinking about a lot um I think people really need to develop a lot of radical empathy and what that means is you know not only seeing your existence as your sole existence and like the issues that you may be tackling um but really thinking about societally you know we just went through this whirlwind of the last four years under trump but you know, now that we're coming out of it, how do we build this empathy to care for one another, to take care of each other? Um, mutual aid organizing does that, you know, where we really, our goal is not to um, make, a, make it a transactional sort of relationship, which is, you know, naturally what happens under capitalism, right? Where every interaction ends up being um, a form of transaction, right? But I think we need to move away from that. We need to really understand that through radical empathy, we need to understand that, you know, we have to um, step in and protect each other and really care for like our neighbors, you know, in my building, when I, when the pandemic happened, I was like, who are, who are the elderly people that live alone? How do we like make sure that they have groceries so that they're not going outside, you know? And these are the things and these are the conversations and this is the framework we need to be operating from. 
Um, there is so much work to be done. I think I am very much um, following the leadership of Black women in this country that you know delivered us a lot of wins, such as what happened in Georgia. Um, and I'm really looking to this infrastructure of uh, revolution and resilience that has always um, kind of existed within indigenous black communities and as you know an immigrant and as a person of color i am looking to folks that have been doing this work for so long and really looking for that guidance so i think all of us should be not complacent and really doing that research and looking into like you know um how do i make myself more educated more aware how do i really um be not just throwing money at a problem because that's also on one of the other issues is that folks sometimes will see a problem and be like oh let me just throw some money at it and that's my form of like you know advocacy or activism but we need to really be doing stuff we need to be speaking to each other we need to be creating spaces to have conversations um we need to hold institutions accountable we need to hold the government accountable we need to hold police forces and the military accountable we and when i talk about the budget we also really need to understand that we do need to defund the police because the police is not taking care of us you know we need more social services there's going to there is already a social awakening that has to happen because of covid things cannot go back to normal you know this normalcy did not benefit communities of color and poor people and so we really need to understand that we we need to shift how we're thinking of society in the next 5 10 20 years right um i would like to definitely highlight um mutual aid organizations and i know that in some bigger cities there's also community fridge networks you know so definitely donating um getting involved volunteering um and you know mutual aid groups are really functioning as like often you know people are like oh how do i can i can how do i um give you this large grant and i'm like you really can't because of the fact that we literally started this as a result of this pandemic and we're not a 501c3 but you can donate and you can help us like raise money so that we can feed people and we can give cash grants to undocumented families and you know who have not gotten any sort sort of assistance um during this pandemic and even the assistance that has come from the state or federal government has been very very uh like really small right the amounts are just like abysmal um so i think funding mutual aid groups i know that one of the com questions that was posed was around the bronx mutual aid network and um fordham university which is a university here in the bronx and like you know drawing those lines of um bringing mutual aid within even university campuses right of like even at st lawrence i imagine there's a lot of international students that are estranged from their family right now checking in on them creating this community care network where people feel um that they have support that they don't feel isolated mental health is really one of the biggest um effects of this pandemic that we're going to be dealing with we are not even realizing how much we all are collectively suffering because we have received so much news of death in the time span of one year and we need to process that right so like investing into um organizations and uh, and infrastructures that support mental health services for communities of color that's something that's really important um definitely mutual aid groups um community fridge groups and finding those local resources as well as um definitely supporting you know the movement for black lives but also thinking about you know not just like big umbrella organizations but smaller organizations that need that support because i think often people throw money and throw support to like really big organizations and don't think about you know how do i support locally and i think when you do support locally that's going to have the most impact so i think just thinking about you know um where we're go where we are right now where we're going and how to like take care of each other and i think one last thing i'll just mention um of what has to be done is like literally taking care of yourself. I think, you know, everyone is going through so much in this moment. And I think um, we need to create these uh, opportunities and, and spaces for joy, spaces for celebration, even amongst a pandemic, you know, because at the end of the day, 
people's lives have um, halted because of because of COVID. But at the end, at but we also still are human beings that need some form of joy and some form of um, support and love in our lives and really making sure that we're checking on in on people and we're taking care of our own bodies and our own health. I've lost friends who are in their early 30s and that has been alarming. That shook me to my core because that made me realize, oh my God, here I am as an organizer and activist and I've just been running on, you know, running just all these things and not taking care of myself. And I had to take a step back to be like, okay, no, I need to really, um, function better if I really prioritize taking care of myself so I can show up to the movement ready. So I think definitely um, having all of these aspects of radical empathy and self-care. And Mari, I'm community organizer in the Bronx. Thank you so much for, for sharing those words with us. I'd be remiss, I think, in my, um, my role as moderator if I didn't also mention uh, as a concrete step, supporting independent media we need independent grassroots media. Um, and in that light, I encourage uh, all of you to, to visit weavenews.org in the coming days for follow-up article on tonight's discussion. Uh, you'll also find plenty of ongoing coverage of social justice stories from around the world, as well as information about how you can join us in our work as grassroots uh, media makers. We're on Twitter at Weave News. We're on Instagram at Weave News Now. I also wanna say some thanks before we finish up tonight. A big thanks to Steve Millington to Skylar Bergeron and Iman Maani for their assistance with putting together tonight's event. Huge thanks to our panelists. Uh, nothing but gratitude to all of you for taking the time uh, to share your perspectives with us this evening. And most of all, um, to those, those of you joining us on Zoom and on, on Facebook Live, thank you for spending part of your evening with us. On behalf of the whole team at Weave News, um, I'm John Collins. Hope you stay safe. Keep your hoping machine running and have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Steve, really great to 